number 6.3, and this issue involving inappropriate intense anger. What does it say? If you could read that out loud, please. What part of it would you like me to read? Pardon? What part of it would you like me to read? The second paragraph. From the beginning. Beginning with however. However, you already know the secret. I don't need to remind you, but you are so powerful and you can turn the situation around at any time. I found out, much to my regret, that my anger is very destructive. Oh, slow down a little bit. The court reporter's having a hard time. Sorry. You know, I've never beaten up anybody over it, but I've kicked holes in the walls, kicked down doors, smashed windows, broken things. It hurts people, and it hurts me. Keep going, the whole paragraph. It lowers my vibration and attracts unwanted, lower vibrational situations and people into my life. So I strive every day to be the bigger person and be a living example and choose the right and see everything through a filter of love. But it doesn't always work that way. I mess up. Sometimes I forget who I am, but I will never stop striving to be Christ-like as much as I possibly can. Is that part of the inappropriate intense anger that you were talking about? Yes, that's one example. And this actually was written by the defendant, Exhibit 623, on what date? That was on February 14th, 2007. At what time? 1658. And 1658 is what time in 24 hours? Do you know what that I is? I would assume it's 4 o'clock. Well, wouldn't it be 458? 458, I'm sorry. If it's 458, uh, are you familiar with the story involving the defendant and the fact that did you and she discussed her receiving some candy or some underwear or something from uh, Mr. Alexander in, on February 14th of 2007? Yes, that she received underwear. And on that, it's the same day, right? Yes. If it's the same day and she's writing these things, if she's received these items and is now writing this, does that impact or does that affect or does it in, is it included in one of these uh, symptoms that you, we've just talked about involving persona, borderline personality disorder? Can you clarify? Well, specifically, she's just supposedly is a gift from what you know. Is it a gift, a good thing or a bad thing? A positive thing. And then we're talking about what here? Positive or negative things? Negative. And so is that something that you see with regard to um, perhaps unstable and intense interpersonal relationships? Or is that not any part of this borderline personality disorder issue? I would say that I can't make that relation without more information. Okay. We were t about to talk about... Uh, whether or not you agreed with Dr. Samuels about uh, wh whether or not this was post-traumatic stress disorder, correct? Correct. And you indicated that you disagreed, correct? Correct. In terms of this case, um, did you uh, prepare a report? I did. And with regard to the preparation of the report, how is it that you go about preparing it? I understand that you have to prepare the the content, but, but who, in, in your office, who does the typing? I do. And who does the reviewing of the report? I do. And so any errors that are there, whose errors are those? They're mine. And in this case, with regard to um, Dr. Samuels, are you familiar with, and I'll show you exhibit number 544, with his conclusion and diagnosis that the defendant, um, according to him, falls clearly under criteria A1, A2, B3, C3, C6, and D3 for post-traumatic stress disorder. Are you familiar with that? Yes. If, a, if an individual is making that assessment... All right, let's hit the pause button. You won't miss a moment of testimony. A, if an individual is making that assessment, 
is that fall short under either C or D for post-traumatic stress disorder? Objection is characterized as Dr. Samuel's testimony. Overall, to me, answer. According to this, it does fall short. And where does it fall short? Which section? The number of criteria. And the criteria are under A, B, C, or D? It falls short in D, and I'd have to review C to ensure that it fall, falls short. You indicated that you've reviewed this case and that you disagree that this is post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, I want to talk about your disagreement with Dr. Samuels as to why you, you believe that this is not a case of post-traumatic stress disorder. So how does that work in terms of the DSM and how you go about making that determination? Can you tell me how that works generally? Sure. There are three primary, cat well, four categories of symptoms that we look for that suggest the presence of PTSD. And, and these four categories, do you know off the top of your head, for example, what the first category deals with? It's just the presence of whether the person experienced a traumatic event, that they experienced a strong sense of fear, helplessness, horror as a result of it. How about the second, if you will, a general category. What does that talk about? The second category pertains to the tendency to re-experience symptoms. Okay, and the, and the third one, which would be the C, what does that one refer to? That's referred to as avoidance. And what does that mean? The tendency to avoid stimuli, thoughts, anything related to the trauma. And number four? The last one is termed increased arousal. There's a number of symptoms that fall under that. And what does it mean to have increased arousal as it applies to this particular um, section of the DSM-4 and PTSD. It's a change of arousal. For example, a, a new, newly dis developed tendency to become angry or the tendency to be hypervigilant, which means to be hypersensitive to your environment, looking around, making sure that you're safe, having an exaggerated startle response. If someone walks in the room, your body might jolt in a way that it typically doesn't. Those are some examples. Under A, if you could tell us again, because you went a little bit quickly on it, uh, what it refers to and whether or not you agree or disagree with uh, Dr. Samuels as to whether or not the defendant meets that criteria. A is the presence of a traumatic event that, so, ca go ahead. that causes a strong sense of horror, fear. So do you agree or disagree with Dr. Samuels as to that, whether or not the defendant meets it? Dr. Samuels indicated that he, that she experienced PTSD as a result of the killing. And so, um, do you agree or disagree with his assessment there? The way that she describes it, she felt fear for her life. So she would meet criteria for A, yes. Well, what about the fact that perhaps there was these two intruders that came in? If these two intruders came in and there's this an event, is that the basis for this meeting this criteria. If that's what he based his diagnosis on, then that would be inaccurate. And would you then agree that, that that's, and if you can't meet the first criteria, in other words, if you are basing it, let's assume that uh, it's a, an event that may or may not have occurred. If it's an event that didn't occur, would that automatically do away with post-traumatic stress disorder? Objection is characterized as Dr. Overruled, the jury is directed to recall the testimony presented during the trial. Would that do that? As I, yes, because as I highlighted earlier, the symptoms are strongly related to the actual trauma, which is that criteria A that you're referring to. So if there is no trauma, let's assume in, th in this case, if there are no two intruders that came in, hence no trauma, would that then um, speak against the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder? Correct. What was your answer? Correct. So does there have to be an actual event that triggers this or can, it, or can this post-traumatic stress disorder be based on a made up event? It cannot be based on a made up event. Um, one of the things that you also indicated was that... Okay, let's go ahead and hit pause. You also indicated was that Dr. Karp also found that there was post-traumatic stress disorder, right? 
That's correct. And with regard to her post-traumatic stress disorder, what was, what was or what were the triggering events? She indicated that Ms. Arias developed PTSD as a result of the physical abuse that she in allegedly endured from Mr. Alexander. And let's assume that there was no physical abuse. Would that then, in terms of finding post-traumatic stress disorder, would that indicate that yes, the diagnosis was appropriate or not if those events did not occur? Similar to before, if the event is not true, then the subsequent criteria wouldn't apply. But if the event involved, you said that if the event involved the killing, and if that's what Dr. Samuels based it on, even though we have this PDS issue, then you would agree with him that it is, it could be an event that triggers um, this reaction. I would agree that it would meet the criteria for A. What about B? What, what, what is that again? What are we talking about with regard to B? What is the uh, overall subject of that? B is re-experiencing the tendency to think about and relive the experience, the traumatic event. So what we're talking about with regard to this one is we're talking about re-experiencing, correct? Yes. And on this one, I'll give you exhibit number 545. Please take a look at it. Let me know how many symptoms there are there and how many must be met. There are five symptoms that are listed here. And how many must be met? One or more. So it's one of five, correct? Yes. All right. Make fun of that the back once you looked at it. What is the first symptom that we're talking about? with regard to this re-experiencing, and that would be B, correct? That yes, would be the B, to B, yes. What is the first symptom? I would have to reference back. Right. I know the category as a whole that I could speak about. Why don't you just keep this up here? Okay. Let me know when you are referring to it. Okay. So what is the first one? Recurrent and intrusive distressing recollections. What was the first word again? Recurrent. Uh-huh. And intrusive distressing recollections. And re recurrent and Distress. intrusive? Recurrent and intrusive distressing recollections. Tell me about that. What does that refer to? What we see as this symptom is that thoughts about the trauma keep invading their mind, essentially. Right. It creeps in constantly, where it, it causes intense distress inside of them. It bothers them. They're thinking about it a lot. And does the defendant meet this criteria? There's indication that she thought about it, but not to the level that we see in people with PTSD. What, what do you mean? It, it sounds like uh, you're saying, yeah, she thought about it, but no, she didn't. Why don't, why don't you explain to me what you mean? So in any kind of negative event, it's, it's not uncommon for people to think about it. That's very different from it developing into PTSD. For example, uh, some of my own patients, they're so bothered by their thoughts of whatever traumatic event that they experience that it causes difficulty for them to engage in day-to-day -day behaviors and activities. And did the defendant manifest this to you at all during the clinical interview? No. How about in her journals, for example, um, did any of those journals indicate that she had this recurrent and intrusive depressive recollection? Distressing. I'm sorry, no. distressing recollection. She did not? No. Okay, what is the next item? Recurrent distressing dreams of the event. Dis uh, recurrent distressing dreams of the event, right? Correct. And it seems self-explanatory, but tell me about it. They're having nightmares and dreams about what happened. 
And frequently, did, recurrent. And did the defendant report any of this to you? She indicated that she had some dreams about it, but not recurrent. And uh, her journals did it. Janine Demarty, psychologist, continuing to, to go down the list.